Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Coaches and Content Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Scholl, and on this podcast, we teach coaches, entrepreneurs, business owners how to get more clients through creating content. And as always, I have a special guest, and this week, I actually have a unicorn. Yes, <laughs> unicorns are real. I have David Tam today. Make some noise for David Tam. David, how are we doing today? Great, man. Thanks for having me on, buddy. How are you? I'm great. Um, I hope you're doing well. I know you're always doing well. So, guys, um, you know, not only is David super smart. Listen, I'm, I'm going to flatter you right now, David, so I hope it's okay. Sure, go for it. <laughs> not only is David super smart, super successful, he's started and created, sold multiple businesses. Not only is he super humble, not only is he super handsome, oh. on my podcast today, he's taking out the time to talk with me, and he wants to help you guys. So, David... I really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, totally, man. I'm, it's, it's good to see you grow and you're out there trying to help other people through content and media. I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I'm privileged to be here, man. Yeah, guys, the best thing about David is that he, if you're putting in the work and you're doing what you're doing, he wants to help you. And that's most successful people are like that. Like when people see you making the effort and doing your own thing, they want to help you. Um, so David has helped me so much. I'll never know how much he helped me. And I hope to pass it on to you guys help you guys with this interview today. That's what it's all about, right, David? That, you know, it's exactly. I was thinking about this interview this morning of like, what are some of the things that I want to get across? And, and, and for me, it's the difference between coaching and, and mentorship is one of them that I feel like it's, it's lost on a lot of business leaders because especially in the real estate space, you know, because you're used to paying for coaching. Well, I've got five, six, maybe seven people that I mentor and that's not to brag. And there's, there's no money changing hands there. And Zach, you're one of those people of, you can ask me questions. I know that you're going to put thought into that question before you ask me. You're going to do the research on your own before you approach me. And so when you come to me, it's, it's um, very focused and I'm, we're able to have a very brief conversation, boom, and set you on your way. And I feel that by, and, and, and what did I tell you? I said, it's, if I'm going to help you with this stuff, my expectation is when you're in my position that you do the same for others. Right. And that's how I think we make the business world and the ecosystem a better place. So, and you're well on your way, friend. So yeah, you nailed it. That's exactly right. Oh, thanks, man. Um, yeah. So why don't we, I always like to kind of start, get to give people a background and why you, they should listen to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were, <laughs> cause I listen to you all the time. So I, they should listen to you too. So, um, you know, you were, you were in the air force, um, but you've been a serial entrepreneur. Um, so how many, you You've created and sold how many companies? Well, I haven't sold very many. We're in the process of, of a couple of transactions right now. But uh, so, yeah, I was I came from Boulder, Colorado in the service industry. I mean, I've been working full time since I was age 14, like seriously, to make my own way. I've attended six universities. I've lived all over the world, got a few college degrees, written a book, got a second one on the way. Um, I'm just I'm a nerd. Right. And that's not to like fly my own flags. I really love what I do. And um, so I enlisted in the Air Force as a mechanic, became an officer, an aviator, did a combat deployment, um, studied marketing and, and all over the place. I've, I've, I got invited to go do a little think tank thing at, at Google headquarters in Arizona, their data center. So um, as far as the number of companies, yeah, co-founded FirePoint with family that, I don't know, 4,500 users, it was acquired from there, um, Cast Services, you know, digital marketing company, ownership, insurance, ownership. Uh, mortgage, those are both joint venture opportunities, uh, Pensarita, and I've got a consulting service. So about six or seven right now. Um, but, but, you know, it's not like, it's, it's not one and then stop and go do another. It's, you know, for me, typically I've got two, three, maybe four in flight at any given time. And then also mentoring a bunch of people along the way. But I feel that oftentimes the mentoring piece fuels a lot of the other projects. You know what I mean? Because if like I want people in my sphere that work really hard or talented and hungry. And those are the people that oftentimes make really good fits for startups. So yeah, current gig right now is, is Pensarita. I'm there full time. It's a legacy preservation platform. You can check it out at um, pensarita.com. It's P-E-N-C-E-R-I-T-A.com. Yeah, I'll put the links. Uh, I always put the link in the description. Awesome. Yeah, I would love to, I know Pensarita is still kind of new, but I would love to touch yeah. on that a little bit. Sure. Because from what you told me, it's going to change the world and it's going to it's going to bring the social, you know, back into social media and leave out the negativity and all that other stuff. So can you give like a brief description of what Pensarita is? 
Yeah, so it's a it's a legacy preservation platform, right? It's we're definitely not social media. It's I feel social media was like a crash test experiment, right, for the last ten to fifteen years, with with a ton of toxicity and nothing has been regulated. All of your data is just being stolen and then bought and sold, and you you see no benefit, right? You're the product, um, and we want to get away from that. So Pensarita is is a platform you can use for free to create content that is media agnostic. So unlike Facebook, right, where it's just picture, text, video, text, add, 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 add. You know what I mean? It's You can actually create long form content with drag and drop all types of media, music, art, text. We can transcribe voice into text. And so that you can actually tell your story centered around major life events, preserving your legacy, or just you're out at a wedding having fun and you wanna create some content. We've got patent pending technology now. We've got a whole lot of patents that we're going after because none of this has been done before where you can actually collaborate where you can go in and create content and other people can be in there at the same time adding their content so that let's let's say a wedding, like a bride and a groom, they could relive that event through other people's eyes anytime they want. And then we've got some really sexy AI that we're using to curate content paths, essentially so you can be remembered how you want to be remembered away from all the toxicity and really tell your story in a private manner. So that's Pensarita. Yeah, so it's basically like if I, if we all went to a wedding, I have photos, you have photos, we can all put them in one central place for everyone to look at them. Yes, and then you can toggle on and off rule sets of who gets to see them and when and where. And then one of the really keystone awesome pieces of tech is um, delayed sharing, right? This doesn't exist really anywhere in the world. And so the ability to, for me, I want to create content, messages of love to, let's say, my wife for our 10th wedding anniversary. Well, we're only on year two. We're about to have wedding anniversary two next month. But but I can set a rule set. I can create all this content with video and art and music and text. And, and it's it's long form, customizable, and then set a trigger for on our 10th wedding anniversary. No matter what happens to me or where I am, she's going to get that. Hey, there's something waiting for you in Pensarita. And so we're doing this right now with like my grandmother, who's 92, sending, hey, congratulations on getting married to four-year-old nieces for when they get married 20 years from now, when she's long gone, right? And I think that's going to make the world a better place. That's awesome. So, and you know, this isn't like some guy in his basement making a website. Like you have an executive board, you yeah. have like some serious people involved. Um, yeah. how, how did you, you know, you know a lot of people, but how do you bring this, how did this all come together? Like, how do you get all these people on board? Because this is a really, like I said, it's a serious thing. It's not just yeah. a website. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got 22 team members. Um, we've got the former chief of staff of Starbucks. We've got a massive legal team with a lot of talent funding um, and obviously patents and IP wrapping around it. And we're planning on launching this globally, right? So we've got international trademarks, the whole deal. How? Well, it all starts with an idea, right? So like for me, Zach, um, I we're going to get a little personal here. That's okay. Um, when I was in the military, uh, I went on a combat deployment. And I came back and my grandfather um, had been, you know, he's in his later years. He was in his early 90s and starting to get dementia. And my last conversation with him before he passed away, I was still in the military. I had to get back to base, you know, to get on with my job. Um, and he had, he had no idea who I was. I mean, I was having a conversation with a stranger. And it was like, man, that sucks. <laughs> and how many people have had to deal with that? Not just in our generation, but the last 5,000 plus years, you know? And, and so that it really stuck with me. And I'm, I'm kind of a, what I call a passive noodler. Like I'll just noodle on stuff passively while I'm having a beer thinking about, you know, like last night I was just thinking about titles for my next book, you know, just kind of that's the way my brain processes. And I came back from a conference. Um, I was speaking on stage in Fargo with Air Catch. <laughs> and and I, I, I fell asleep on the plane and I just woke up with the idea. And I'm like, and it was given to me, like that idea was shot into my brain by God, aliens, whatever. It was like, it, it was not my idea, but I, I took it and I wrote it down and I just kept writing and writing and writing. And I had, by, by the end of that flight, I had wire diagrams for how the company would work, what it would be called. Um, and then I started to, I can program a little bit, right? Took programming classes and all that kind of stuff. And um, we did a bunch of development work at Firepoint. And, and I started to wire it out, build the tech like myself. Um, racking up, you know, credit card debt, spending savings with developers overseas, trying to do it myself. And guys, this is a lesson for you. Like you don't have to do it yourself. And so what I did is I, I formalized the idea and I pulled in two or three of my very closest confidants to like throw it against them say, what do you think? And 
everybody so far has been like, whoa, that's, that's, a, that's got, that's a good, you know? And I'm like, be honest, you know, I don't want to be flattered. If you think it's crap, tell me it's crap. But people are like, maybe we could change X, Y, Z. So I brought together a small team, got it to that next stage, you know, formulated LC, brought in the legal team, um, eventually had a couple of guys that are like, we'll throw cash in. Like if you're accepting money, you know, for a little bit of equity and we'll help guide the company. And these are like high, high level entrepreneurs. I was like, absolutely, right? Because I need help. And my wife's going to shoot me if I keep spending our money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, and so that's what I did. And I just, I've been building this thing for three and a half years. And it's my first all on my own, my gig, right? I'm not doing this with, with family. It's me. And that's, that was a big step for me because Firepoint was with family, Cast was with family, Ownership Financial was with family. And this one, I'm like, I'm going to do this on my own. And, uh, and that's kind of where it is. And I just, I'm loving it, man. And I could tell how, you're always super excited and super positive, but the, I see your face light up. Talk about Pensarita. Like I could tell, you know, oh. this thing's going to be big because of how you are. Um, I want, you know, I wanted to ask you how you, cause you just kind of touched on it, but for everyone, we have ideas all the time, business sure. ideas, whatever. Um, and you just did a great breakdown of how to execute it and make it come to life. Yeah. How could, how could you, you've had a lot of ideas come to life. How, yeah. how, what's like a quick breakdown for people how to actually, cause we all have great ideas, but how many of us actually execute them? So what's you like know, a, in your mind, how do you execute, make them bring it to life? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like, there is a formula to this. Like it is solvable. It's teachable. In fact, I'm, I'm writing a book on this exact subject of, uh, and I'm not, I, we're not going to talk about that book right now because I've got another one I've got to get out before that one comes out. But like, I love to write as well, if you can't tell. Um, well, mainly because I like to teach. Uh, Zach, I've been through 39 years of life. I've lived a lot of life and I have had so much failure, way more failure than I've had success. And I think that's really important for like an entrepreneur to understand, you know, and that's okay. Like those are just missed opportunities at success. Like I don't call them failures. It's all good, right? So if you have an idea, um, first of all, the most important thing is write it down because our minds are like Swiss cheese and you know what I mean? And we'll, we'll forget things and then, you know what I mean? And, and forget that we even forgot them and then they're gone forever. And I believe really good ideas. If you're not going to execute on them, that idea is going to float out into somebody else's brain that is, and you know what? There's other people that are starting to work on legacy preservation tech right now. And, and I'm, I'm not worried. That means that I'm going after something really appealing, right? That, that there's a need for. Why? Well, it's the largest transition of handover of wealth uh, in the next five years that there ever have been in the, in the history of the human race, right? And, and so like, it's a big thing. It's important. So if you've got an idea, first of all, whether it's a Google Doc, a bar napkin with purple crayon, just start writing it down and then get creative. Who's going to use it? How am I going to build it? What are some potential um, hangups? What don't I know, right? And, and I, I just call them working docs. And I've, I think you've seen several of mine, right, mm -hmm. Zach? Where yeah, it's just yeah. a Google Doc mm -hmm. and we go through the basic business fundamentals of, okay, well then let's talk about how are we gonna market, operations, legal, finance. That's a finite set of, of things that need to be tackled, industry specific, right? So if we're gonna do create something and do uh, you know a supply chain with it, we're gonna need warehousing and staff and production facilities. But in the digital space, you don't need all that stuff. So then you wanna do competitive analysis. So that's step one. Step two is do a competitive analysis. Does somebody else already have this idea or is it already being executed? And a lot of times that's where kind of the idea goes to die because it's like, oh yeah, somebody's already thought of it. Well. Don't think just because somebody else has thought of it that that's a showstopper for you. What you need to do then is, well, are they doing anything with it? Because, and then if they're not doing anything with it, well, are they marketing it correctly, right? Because there's market makers and then there's market takers. Sometimes you can be both. And so don't, just because there might be a competitor two or 10 out there, if you've got something that's unique, whether it's technology, a value proposition, people, patents, whatever, you can still be successful. So don't get discouraged. And then start to scope out, what's it gonna take? How fast am I gonna have to run? How far am I gonna have to run? How much money am I gonna have to spend, right? And then if you can't do it all on your own because you don't have the experience, start pulling people inside, but be very, very careful with this one, right? Because when money starts growing, your friends don't become your friends anymore. They become your enemies. And as soon as there's an exit, 
your own family members will sue you over it, right? And so you got to be really careful about who you bring in and make sure you trust them with your life. And if you don't, keep them out. Is my is that's my opinion, right? Um, because because character flaws don't get smaller, they get bigger when dollar amounts increase. Okay. And so um, and then from there, start looking at how do I protect it? What am I gonna call it? So trademarks, patents, trade names, IP, trade secrets. What is special about my idea that other people aren't doing? And if you need guidance on this, you can reach out to me and I've got you know kind of a playbook of who I use and who I go to. That's my Rolodex of. I mean, I've got, I've got seven different projects right now, all of which are going to be going patent pending IP in a bunch of different industries of just people that pulled me in and said, hey, we need help marketing. We need help with operations. And whether it's a little bit of equity or we do it pro bono, um, it's an honor to be part of those projects too. So that's, that's kind of how it starts. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it answered my question and more. I think oh, uh, that was a great breakdown. So I think I think a lot of people might just get overwhelmed. They could have like the best idea ever and they don't know how yeah. to do it. Cause actually I have a good example. Um in college, you know, all the bars were kind of far and we had to walk over a mile. And I was like, you know, we sh I should get like a shuttle bus and I can drive people, they can pay me, and I can drive them to the bar and back. And I never executed the idea, but about six months later, somebody else did, and I was riding their bus six months later. You know, yeah. I don't know if they're still doing it, but I was like, damn, I had the idea, and like you said. It went to his brain, it went from my brain to his brain, and he did it. Well, then you have to think about, yes, and that's, that's just how it works. And that's okay. And those are great lessons of, you know how many people have come to me and said, oh my gosh, I was having a conversation with a friend about, um, you know, I write letters in my email in a secret inbox for my daughter. And then when I die or something, she's going to get access. Like that's like square 0.0, .0 Pensarita. We've just taken it and run with it a thousand meters forward. You know what I mean? Extremely fast. So that's not a bad thing, right? Do you then have to assess, well, opportunity cost. Is it really worth my time to go execute that idea? Is it big enough? Is it appealing enough? Is it lucrative enough, right? Versus what I am currently doing. And so oftentimes I'm an idea broker is I've got entrepreneurs that are funded, hungry, and talented that are looking for that next project. Oftentimes you can take that idea protect it and then monetize it. Hey, listen, I've got this really cool idea. I've got the business plan. I know how it's going to be executed. Do you want to run with it? I'll take half. I'll take a quarter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So get creative. Even if you don't think you can personally execute, pull one other person in. Okay. I'm going to give you an example. I was, uh, stuff like this just happens to me randomly all the time. Kind of like meeting you, Zach. I was going to get my, my blood test and my weight and all that kind of stuff done for my life insurance policy. Cause I got out of the military in the military, you've got the SGLI, its own like insurance if you get schwacked. Um, but on the outside, I didn't have it. So I'm going to get all these tests done. And a lady that was doing my bio testing, she's like in her 50s, extremely thorough, like shockingly thorough, and did my heart thing like twice to make sure we got a really good pulse. And then we got to talking about business. She was like, Yeah, you know, I've got this like idea I've been thinking about for the last 10 years or so. Cause she was asking me what I did. And I'm like, kind of a serial entrepreneur, kind of a nor like a, dirt, uh, a, a nerd who was a, uh, a convergence between dork and nerd. <laughs> and uh, and she pitched this idea to me and it's really good of how to like formalize and scale. And she's already got like 22% market share in the, in the current geographic region. And I'm like, this is really good. So I've been meeting with her at Starbucks once a month. We talk for 30 minutes every Friday and I'm just helping kind of push her along, right? No money changing hands. But every time she's like, I need to give you a piece of this. I need to give you a piece of this. I'm like, when it's time, when we do our operating agreement, you can give me a piece, but let's make sure that you are on your way, you know, with the afterburners on before I take any equity. And, and I think that's a really cool way to do it is just to help people as much as you can so that you're not the one trying to steal equity, like the, the barren, you know, robber uh, that we see so much in the entrepreneurial space that I've personally dealt with, right? Um, that you need to be careful of. So, so yes, that's it in a nutshell. Um, what other questions do you have? <laughs> I'm just curious, where does this, I wish more people were like this, where you're just selfish and want to help people. And then if you get something in return, that's fine. I'm just curious, where did that come from? That I always like to ask people about their mentality and their habits. It's something that yeah. they were born with, they developed. So where do you think that came from for you? Like your willingness to just help people that are putting in the work, you know? I think it came from working in restaurants. So like I was age four, I went to a really affluent high school and we weren't, we were like, 
um, probably middle class, lower middle class, right? And so for me, it was like, I was the guy that was working every single weeknight and the weekends while everybody else is partying. And so for me, it was, I had a bunch of guys that, and gals that took me under their wing and like really showed me like how to perform. And, and within a year, I had keys to the restaurant and I was opening restaurants all over the city as a 15 year old, right? And, and so I had really strong work ethic driven mentors from early on. And then my parents, they were always very generous with their time and the money that they did have, you know what I mean? And that, that rubbed off on me and it made a huge impact. And then it was all taken to the next level in the military. Because in the military, it's, it does not matter what you look like, <laughs> smell like, act like, as long as you work hard and you're kind to others and you can execute. And for me, it was, that was just a light bulb moment. And so I started volunteering like crazy. I mean, I was, I was nominated for the volunteer of the year on an island, 18,000 service members, because I just, every, every evening, every weekend, I was out trying to help people and it just fed my soul. Like it made me happy, you know, like, and, and for me, maybe it's how I was born, but I think if I was born in different circumstances, if I had everything handed to me, I wouldn't be this way. You know what I mean? And, and I want I, other people that are struggling, trying to make it through that if I can take 30 minutes of Friday to change your life, as long as we have that verbal contract that when you're in my shoes, you better do it for other people. Otherwise this is done. You know what I mean? Like that holding somebody's feet to the fire to make them be a better person is an amazing tool. And so I think that's where it comes from. And I just, I like seeing people succeed. I think that's how we make the world a better place. Yeah. You know, I've, what I've learned is the more, and someone told me this too, it's like the more doors you open up for someone else, the more doors open up for you. So like, if you're just selfish, it always seems to help you in the end anyway. Well, don't get me wrong. I'm not Mother Teresa. I still, I am, I am financially driven. I, I am in a, a shameless capitalist. I believe in a free market economy and I believe in knowing your own value. You know what I mean? And I have a, a, a pretty price to like for my consulting fee that, that people pay billion dollar firms pay me to consult, to help them um, through, through various you know, struggles that they're dealing with. Um, but that, that allows me to give my time, right? So I've worked my butt off to be able to command a high salary or hourly consulting rate so that I can spend some free time to help other people. So it's a balancing act. Right. Um, and I think that's important for everybody to understand. And, and so, you know, if anybody has questions that's listening to this of how they can start that process, I mean, seriously, reach out or comment and I can give my feedback. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a good time to segue. You know, you're mentioning your skills and I think it's a good time to segue into some marketing and yeah. stuff like that. Actual advice. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I love what we were talking about, but I know my audience will always wants some actual, actionable. I can't say the word. Actual. But, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you, you know everything about marketing uh, and you're always on the edge of stuff and you're always ahead of the times. Um, so I'm curious. I don't know. Where should we even dive in? I mean, let's start with the basics. So like, let's say I'm a coach. I'm an entrepreneur. You know, you yeah. and I have talked about automation and I think that I haven't talked about that too much on here. And I know for me personally, I've learned that it's helped me so much when you in, implement um, auto, automation. Yeah. Um, so let's, can we briefly talk about like the basics of automation and some simple stuff people don't know that they could automate and kind of how it works? Yeah, I mean, totally. Like, all, so a lot of this, and by the way, I have to caveat, I know very little about marketing compared to what is all out there. I, I've studied entrepreneurship and marketing for almost 20 years now. Um, and I've got some really good mentors in the space, but like the more I learn, the more I understand how little I know, like marketing is like, it is the endless rabbit hole, right? So let's set the tense with that. But, um, I have had some success in the marketing, um, segment and, and automation is a big piece of that with automation. I use automation in the workflow space with marketing, um, mainly for email correspondence. So reaching out to clients, right? Email flows versus email drips. So let me, let me explain the difference of that. Like an email drip is like what we think about in the real estate space of, okay, I've got a potential buyer or I've got a potential seller and they're going to get a certain number of emails over a certain amount of time, but I am not being reactive based off of their behavior, right? I'm just assigning them to a campaign and all right, you're good. You might as well, you know, like maybe it'll pop up in three years. That's, it's very basic. And, and email drips are, are kind of a dying breed. And that's probably going to be a shock to a lot of the CRMs that are still like asleep at the wheel, right? Who have not innovated in the last five years when it comes to their email campaigns. 
Um, email flows is a far more integrated approach. Both of these can be automated through various tools. You can reach out and I can show you some of those tools. There's also some firms that'll do it for you, but really you can do some of this stuff just off of a, a guy on Upwork and a platform for a monthly fee. It's that simple. An email flow is, okay, I'm sending out an email to different buckets, right? So prospects, current clients, repeat clients, investors, advisors. And then what I'm doing is I'm measuring what their response is. Did they open it? If so, how fast? How long did they spend in the email? Did they click on the link? Did they register on the link? And each one of those is a decision tree. Okay, so if they didn't open it, well, why? Then I need to send them a different email, maybe with a different title heading or content at a different time period. If they opened up that one, oh, great. Now I can send them over here, back into the regular flow where they can patch in. Okay, well, maybe they did open it, but they didn't click on the link. Oh, well, I now have to branch that out. Why didn't they click on the link? Right, because so I'm adapting my email content, titles, and tempo to their behavior. And I've seen some of these integrated flow diagrams that 190, 200 different email shells for just a two a two year period. But once it's done, it's done, and you don't have to mess with it. So a net new client, it automatically pops into the flow, and they'll navigate themselves because we have the rule set set up in the automation program which most CRMs couldn't do this if they tried, right? Um, some could, but a lot of the ones in the real estate space couldn't. Does that, does that like set the tone for at least the baseline for automation and email flows? <laughs> I've been doing email marketing for a while and that just blew my mind. The future of the technology of like all these touch points and mm -hmm. all the, the tr just thinking about the tree and how it can react to all, so many different situations. I mean, do you have to actually make all these emails yourself or is a automation doing that? <laughs> yeah, great question. So a, a human needs to be involved in the initial architecture, um, as well as the blessing of the content, imagery and design. Absolutely. Where now AI is getting to the point where it's creating some really good designs, but I don't, I don't trust it um, with my clients and my companies yet. So I, I do use um, artificial intelligence for content writing on a regular basis. So, you know, about like um, my AI driven SEO stuff and really what we're doing there is you can create community pages and content as well as email copy, long form email copy if you want it, like some of the old um, click funnel stuff where you'd open an email and it's like 27 pages long of scrolling nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, artificial intelligence um, can do that now where you can actually give it a baseline couple of sentences or keywords of copy, and then it can generate net new copy that Google can't recognize as copy paste content. So you're not getting flagged for any, you know, copy content stuff. Like a lot of people will just, copy paste off Wikipedia and throw it on their website. Like do not do that <laughs> for various reasons. So yeah, you can use automation um, for a lot of that. I use it as uh, a starting point. And then I put that content through a professional writer, professional designer. And then I've got my marketing coaches and mentors um, that'll oftentimes take a look at it because you know they've, they've done marketing for multi-billion dollar companies and I trust them more than I trust me. So for so maybe someone like a coach or entrepreneur is just getting their feet wet because I think that's also f the future too is this um, automation and AI creating content and stuff like that. How mm -hmm. can some how does somebody get their feet wet or how do they start getting into that because that is the future that could help them so much. You know how how would you advise someone who's new to it to start implementing it into their business? Um, so I would use it. I think the first two places that you use it are in, in content creation on your website to drive indexing for SEO for keywords that you care about. Um, especially if you're not like a, a really good writer. I, I did not have a good writing fundamental basis. Like my, I went to a gifted school where they were teaching me algebra at like eight, at fourth grade, like advanced algebra in fourth grade, but I, I hated reading. And so, so I was not always a good um, writer and, and reader. You know what I mean? I struggled with, with that kind of communication. So this is a really good tool for that. Um, I would say reach out. I don't want to publicly disclose the platforms that I'm using because a lot of them are, I'm in beta access or I'm not allowed to talk about. But if we want to go offline through a message, a direct message or a comment in, in this piece, um, I can share some of those tools. I would do it on the website, but then also you can use it for email communication. And then also think about um, kind of white papers, press releases, you know, eBooks, that kind of stuff. It's a really good tool to kind of seed ideas and generate some baseline content. And then you can go through and kind of redline it and spruce it up to make it your own. That's where I would use it. Right. Cause so you're saying you, so you still need to, you can't just let the computer do everything. You still need to review it, 
check it, put a human touch on it. Yeah, I would recommend that because I have seen some weirdness come out of the AI. <laughs> I mean, like Terminators coming to no, like there's just things that don't linguistically make sense. Um, and that's because uh, artificial intelligence, it's not, it's not like uh, geospecific, right? So they're amalgamating and digesting information in a bunch of different dialects, right? But over time, you know, and so, and so, yeah, you definitely want to have a human bless it, but then also spruce it up and make it your own. Like I, I like to introduce a little bit of humor into, into my, you know, written content, whether it's a book or a blog or an email that I send you, Zach, I always try and make you giggle. You know, I think that's important. So yeah. Giggling, giggling is very important. Dude, laughter is one of the greatest medicines in the world. I'm telling you. Um, so, so, you know, we talked about email a little, I would love to talk about SEO too, because that's still very important. Um, but I still think it's very, it's still hard though, because there's only so many slots on the first page for your keyword. Um, mm -hmm. So how would you, you know, if I'm a coach, I have a coaching business. Yeah. Do you think I need to focus on SEO a lot. Um, is it still really important? You know, what's the future of SEO going to be like? Like, what do you think about that? Yeah. So search engine optimization is, is starting to replace a lot of the paid lead sources, right? So in the paid lead sources, we're talking, you know, Google, PPC, GLS, Google, Google Search ads, and then Facebook. What we're seeing there, and I, I have personally managed tens of millions of dollars of ad spend in all of those channels. So I do speak as an expert here. Um, we, we've seen a lot of volatility and the quality of lead, the quantity of lead, um, as, well, as well as various other factors, right? So the data points associated with the lead cost, CPL, all that kind of stuff. And so there's a hedge against that and organic of how I rank and what I rank for in Google search results is if I can get on page one or page two, I don't have to pay for leads anymore. And I, I have worked with clients where we were able to replace $10,000, $15,000 a month of paid lead spend with SEO. The cool thing is when you turn off PPC or paid leads, the leads just stop. They're done, right? You will not get any more from that minute on. With SEO, you can stop SEO. If you're ranking on page one or page two and you've got 5,000 organic visits a month with a high authority score, you can throttle back on your SEO work and you're still going to get business and recurring traffic and leads on a regular basis. It will fall into grade over time, depending on your competitive environment and geographic location, but it's it's the gift that keeps on giving, right? To self-licking ice cream cone, as well as Google's, so the Core Web Vitals update version 2.0, the current algorithm that's governing who indexes and why on Google, that's getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So like it used to be, you, you had to have a site that was an LCP of 3.5 seconds. That's moving to 2.5 seconds. And as the advent of 5G, um, it becomes ubiqu ubiquitous and, and the, the newer versions of the phones come out, that's going to get even tighter and tighter and tighter because I have connections with Google and this is all the things that are telling me. And so the performance of your website, the fundamental tasks that make SEO effective, those aren't going away. They're, they're getting more restrictive. So if you're not even doing any SEO right now, speeding up your site, optimizing the content, looking at keywords, guys, you're screwed. You're going to be forced to pay for leads for the rest of your life and you will never get organic traffic unless you start to look at it. It's like, you're not going to get buff and stop getting fat by not going to the gym. It's not going to happen. You need to show up and change your behavior. The same is true with SEO. So you think SEO, I mean, I don't know. I can't imagine how much they could change it. You know, it's like you have the website, it has to have words on it, it has to have your keywords and your link, your title. I mean, do you think it's, it's going to become more competitive too? So how do you, what do you see the landscape of SEO? How is it going to change in the next five, 10 years? Yeah, so 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 it's not only site performance. So if you need to have a really good user experience, it needs to be fast. Get rid of all the looping video in your hero sections. Nobody cares about it and it's taking your performance. But the crawlers now that are from the big search engines, right? So Bing is is growing massively right now. They're taking market share from Google, and we'll talk about that maybe on another episode. Um, they're they're not using just a, a bot that goes in and looks, oh, boop, 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 we're good. They're actually using AI crawlers that go in and play with your site and move around and come in and come out and then judge you based on the user experience of that site. This is the market expectation these days. You know, I'm working on a, a research project for a very large firm that's na nationwide, um, kind of in the real estate space. And it was like, I have a slide right here I'm going to pull up because I was working on this just before the call. You know, there's it's like 76% of people today yeah, 76% of consumers will um, search for your website before making a purchase decision. 75% of consumers admit to making judgments on a company's credibility based off of website design and user experience. 
So if you don't have a site that's fun to use, it's not fast, it doesn't have germane content, you're not ranking for any of the keywords, it's fixable. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. I mean, you can do SEO for a couple grand a month and be on page one and two and within six months, in some cases I've seen, you know? So that's kind of, I think where we're headed is user experience, design focused, um, but also performance and speed. And then on the content piece, just do something. Just, you know, it doesn't have to be like three blogs a week or anything like that. Start with one a month. And, and if you don't know what keywords to go after, reach out. There's a bunch of tools that are free to use to say, this is where you stand and this is the keywords you should do for this business goal, like for free. You know what I mean? And we'll point you guys in the right direction. I think yeah. a lot of my audience is like maybe newer people. So that's why I'm trying to break down SEO okay. or, you know, it's a mix of newer people and a little bit more advanced. Um, so that's why I'm trying to figure out what questions to ask to help them because there's so here we could just start now so we'll start now so i'll say um so you know david i have a lot my audience is a mix of newer entrepreneurs some intermediate ones you know some people don't even have a website yet some have somewhat of a website they hear about seo they don't really know what to do or how to get started you yeah. know how do you as a business owner with so much stuff going on in your business mm -hmm. how do you get started with seo that's a, that's a great question. So let's start with um, the entrepreneurs out there that, that maybe don't have a website. So it's, it's obviously, they probably know, it's very, very important to have a website because it's, it's your, your storefront, it's your digital credibility. Right? And like I said, if, if somebody's going to engage with you for any type of transaction, digital or non, you know, they're going to go to your website to check and see if you're legit. And so um, a, a lot of times, you know, kind of crown jewel, the websites that I used to build, like custom websites, we would do those on WordPress and multi-month, if not longer exercise with deep design and content creation and kind of baking in the SEO activities into that process, you know, and that can cost five, six, seven, maybe more, you know, thousand dollars, you know, I built personally, you know, $80,000 websites before, but you don't need that at the gate. You don't, um, you can start with something like Squarespace or Wix. Now understand though that Squarespace and Wix, um, they're canned solutions. You're not gonna have the customizability to add content and do a lot of the SEO activities and load times on Squarespace and Wix are insultingly low. Like there are CRMs out there that use those as their website solution and they rank and index horribly for organic because they're extremely slow. And so I would say, don't bet on Squarespace or Wix being your long-term solution. But if you do need just like, I just need credibility in a site up, boom, go pay the whatever $12 it is and spin it up and have that as your placeholder. But then always be thinking about um, and planning and budgeting for what is my permanent or long-term website solution going to be? And usually that's in a WordPress environment, but we can do them custom PHP, HTML, all that kind of stuff as well. Okay. Now, when we're talking about SEO, search engine optimization, it, it falls in your marketing bucket when you're budgeting. Okay. And, and good quality SEO ranges anywhere from like a grand all the way up to, I, I've known somebody that spends $40,000 a month on SEO. I got my really good friends with, known for 25 years, the guy that runs search engine optimization for Crocs, New Balance, Cores, and a several other, you know, billion dollar companies. Um, and, you know, and talking to him about SEO and their budgets, like below my mind, but you as an entrepreneur, you don't need to go there. What you really need to be thinking about is what do I want to rank for? And how do I want to rank for it? Okay. And so that usually happens through the fundamental SEO tasks. And those are centered around content creation because Google will regularly crawl your website and say, well, what are they talking about? What are they featuring on their site? And it needs to be keyword driven. Okay. Meaning that you need to focus on the content based off of the keywords to meet your consumer where they are based on what they're typing into the Google box. Give you an example. If somebody's looking for a real estate coach. Well, you might want to have some content on how you're a good real estate coach, how long you've been in the industry, maybe some testimonials from some of your you know, clients, that kind of thing. And I can help you with um, the number of keywords and where to place them. And then that, that copy needs to be optimized with the appropriate metadata, kind of the underlying stuff that the consumer is not going to see, but the Google crawler is. And then they're going to judge you. Right, you're gonna get your report and hey, this is your authority score, and then you're gonna see how much organic traffic is coming into your site from those activities. And then we create backlinks, right? We're going out and getting other people to talk about us and write about us, and then we're getting guest blogs. Those are all fundamental SEO activities that that any good SEO provider should be offering you at a reasonable cost with a high level of transparency. Okay, and this is where 
kind of falls down. A lot of the SEO providers out there, they're taking your money and they're just paying some people overseas to build you some sketchy links and crappy content, throwing it on your site and say, pay me. And you don't get a call. You don't know where your money went. You don't get a report. And it's all kind of like window dressing. And you're wondering, where did my money go? If it ever feels like that, you need to terminate that engagement and go somewhere else because that's not the way it should work. All right, SEO should be a collaborative experience where the provider is talking to you and interviewing you and saying, where do you want to work on it? Where does your business want to go? And that's really hard to do if they don't speak English. You know what I mean? That's not a dig. It's just, it makes it difficult. Yeah. Right? I think, I think a lot of people don't know that there's a big, uh, in Philly, there's a big, uh, SEO company and I've heard that they've had unhappy clients and that that's what they do. They're farming it out to work and like it might, SEO might work for a month. And then after that, it doesn't work. You can't get them on the phone. Um, so what are like, what are some things to look for in a good SEO company? Like, how do you know someone's legit before you start dealing with them? First of all, talk to the people on at the company, not just the salespeople, right? Because that's, that's typical for the, they'll hire somebody that's fluent in English or an English speaker native, um, to be the salesperson, to talk up a big, big game, hook you, you're under contract and now you're locked in for six months and you're not going to get any results. Right? Like I literally know one of, one of the big SEO providers from a national coach in the real estate space pays an $87 a month service and charges $900 a month and doesn't even do any work. Literally just upcharges a thousand percent and you don't know the difference and you have no idea where the results are. Yeah, I was going to say, are they getting, they can't be getting results, right? Well, it, that's the thing. It's just churn and burn. They don't care about retention. Hmm. There's, a, there's a lot of companies that's just, let's, let's just wreck everybody, steal all their money. And like, this is a big, big enterprise. And it's, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to get sued, but it, like, it's happening right now. So one of the other things you could do is ask to speak to some of the other clients more than just one of, Hey, do you have two or three clients that I might, you know, ring up and talk to about their experience? Do you have any results that you can actually point to recent results, not reports from five years ago, and then really start to ask the questions. Can you talk to me about the implementation strategy? What am I going to be getting every single month? What can I expect in terms of results? Can I, can I get any kind of promissory on that? You know what I mean? Is there a guarantee? Is there a you know, money back guarantee, anything like that? Um, and then at the end of the day, trust your gut. If you feel like you're being sold something and you're not getting the results you know, that you deserve, you need to bring it up and you need to cause a stink, right? Because having run a, a successful digital services firm and, and multiple marketing companies, like that's table stakes. I, we didn't lose a client for 14 months running and we're growing double digits month after month because we just poured ourselves into our clients to make sure that they were happy, you know, and that's, that's what any SEO firm should be doing. Yeah. And then read the reviews um, and then look at their website. If their website is a dumpster fire and it's not responsive and it doesn't rank well, you know, I'm not going to get a personal trainer that's morbidly obese. Sorry. Like not to be judgmental. It's just, you know, <laughs> that's what we call a red flag. Yeah, there we go. Red flag. <laughs> but I, so I know, I think one other thing too, people like a lot of these agencies will tell you that it takes time to work and it does, but you know, realistically, if I'm starting from scratch today, I'm a real estate coach, you know, what would it take six to 10 months to really start seeing results? Yeah. So that's a, it, it depends, right. And I'm not trying to like hide the answer or anything, but it really does depend. You know, if you're going to start up SEO in Huntington beach, um, good luck because you're going to need, you're not going to be successful on a Wix or Squarespace site because page one and page two is all custom sites with high-end SEO and all the other marketing channels that are feeding the website traffic to boost the SEO results. You know what I mean? If you're out in, um, I don't know, rural Colorado out by the farmlands and there's not a lot of competitors, yeah, you might actually be able to be on page one or page two in the first six months. I've seen that over and over and over, but you've got to have a fast dialed in site You've got to have a regular content release, strong backlink, good auditing, and a really good networking in the SEO space so that you're getting mentioned in other enterprises and businesses and you're mentioning them. You know, it's integrated. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I've seen, I've seen a six to, I'm actually talking with a guy next week who's seen a six to one return on investment in the first 12 months. Um, now, again, that was in a really hot market, right? When it didn't take a lot of skill or talent to make a lot of money in the real estate space. And that's not a dig. It's just, we were in the heaviest, hottest market in the history of the country, right? And it's starting to slow down. So expectations for performance also need to be dialed down as markets cool off with respect to SEO. But the question I always ask is, do you want to pay for leads for the rest of your life and have to nurture them and hunt them? Because a, a paid lead is a very different conversation than an organic registration on your website. 
Okay, when somebody finds you on their own search behavior, they go to your site, they like your site, they read about you, they trust your value proposition, they put in their name, email, and phone number, they give you a call, and they're waiting for you to call back. That's a totally different conversation than random Google lead from Mickey Mouse 5555. I got to call to see if they're real, right? That's my email address. How'd you know my, That's my <laughs> Yeah. And so, so what I look at is, is SEO. It's, it's the long-term, long-term recurring revenue play as an investment in your business. And the other piece to that is, well, guys, SEO and gals, um, it actually has an impact on your P&L directly. Like your website is a monetizable asset. If you can show that my website has 3,000 organic visitors per month, I rank on page one and page two for these 196 terms, and I on average between 20 and 30 organic registrations per month, which convert to transactions on average six to nine months on a 40% basis, dude, you have an ROI figure. My website makes me, I, I air catch. His website was making it's like $30,000 a month just off of organic leads coming in, registering, and turning around. He also has some of the best ISAs in the world and some incredible marketing and great market share, but it worked really well. You know what I mean? So that's, that's kind of the question I like to ask to frame the conversation. Yeah. Eric's also, I call him because he, he was on this podcast. I call him the uh, unofficial mayor of North Dakota. So that helps too. <laughs> if, you, if you ever get a chance to go up to the Hatch Summit in Fargo, do it. Buy your tickets and go. Yeah. Because it is the most, it's the craziest experience. You're like, okay, I'm in Fargo. And then it's like, electric there's 300 people 400 people in a room and they're all sharing like nobody's changing hands they're just all sharing and it's like those hatch summits make me better and yes you're right he's like he's he's definitely the mayor if not higher in that city and state <laughs> yeah i asked him on the podcast i said is it true that you've sold more houses than there are in fargo <laughs> <laughs> what was his answer He's like, I wish. No, that was not true, but I'm close. <laughs> I could see him running for some sort of, you know, political yeah. position there. I think he'd be a good, a good fit. He's very yeah. driven. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, does that, does that answer your question in like an ultra long-winded manner? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, I, I people are going to have to listen to this twice because for every sentence you say, there's like 10 lessons in there. So people are going to have to watch and listen to this twice. Um, I appreciate you taking out time. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I think a good yeah. wrap-up question would be... Um, you know, because you've talked about if you want to do SEO in Huntington Beach, if you want to do it in a small town in Colorado, you know, I have some people who have local businesses, some are nationwide. Yeah. So what's kind of the difference or the strategy between SEO for, you know, for a local town or a local yeah. county with towns in the county or someone who's nationwide? Well, so it's really about budget and what markets we're trying to reach. So I've, I've run SEO programs for both nation, nationwide companies as well as microcosm markets. I, I one for right here in Denver. Right. That's uh, it, they're outside of the real estate space, but it's they're, they're a small market and it has to be people that are in a very close vicinity to do business with them. And so um, really, it's about how much content are we going to be able to create? Um, how are we going to optimize that? How much backlinking are we going to need to be doing? How much optimization on page and off page are we going to have to do? And so, yeah, if we're going to do nationwide, that budget's going to usually be much, much higher. And our website is going to have to be like darn near perfect because then we're competing with national players who a lot of times are multi-billion dollar corporations, right? And so that have insane marketing budgets. I've seen some of their, you know, financials. Um, and, and so it, it's easier to compete in a micro market that you have a little bit of market share in. But, you know, I've helped people that were brand new to a market, just didn't even have a license there, got their license, and within 12 months are on page one or seller and buyer focused terms because they got a fast website and they've been honoring the SEO threat and they were sick of paying for leads you know, off of random sources that just weren't converting. But caveat, SEO is just one of the areas of my expertise. I wrote a book on SEO, right? And I can, we can send links to that or whatever. It's on the CAST website. Um, but I also in all the other omni-channel activities, whether it's remarketing, if it's, uh, you know, satellite-fed geofencing, if it's email campaigns and drips, I'm an expert. I, I, should, I should qualify that. I know a little bit about all those things <laughs> enough to be dangerous. Um, but so if anybody has questions about any of those marketing activities in or outside of the real estate space, I want to be a resources, a resource for coaches and content, you know, to help your entire audience. So, so use me if you need it. Awesome. So, you know, you mentioned all these different tools for businesses and stuff. So where would you rank not to just keep harping on eight on SEO, sure. but you know, as far as like, there's so many, there's omni-channel, social media, email marketing, you know, where would you rank SEO as far as important for a business owner? I mean, in my personal opinion, um, well, let me give you an example, like Pensarita, right? It's my baby. 
um, we're starting SEO from day zero. I mean, we've been working on our go-to-market strategy for well over a year, you know, and building out all of those email flows. Um, SEO is in our cross-check every single day of, okay, who are we talking to? Who are we networking with? What blogs are we going to get on? I mean, I'm already booked for a whole multitude of podcasts and flying down to Austin to do interviews. I'll be in Forbes magazine later this year uh, because we're honoring, you know, that strategy. And a lot of it is, is SEO driven. So it's very high up. I, I always rank SEO over paid leads every day of the week, except if you've got a situation where you just need to feed leads to your agency or team, or they're going to leave, I, I got to put gas in the tank to keep it going. Okay, totally get it, right? To supplement. Or SEO hasn't spun up all the way yet. It's just getting started and you need to feed yourself or your agents. Totally okay too. But just do not rely on volatile paid leads for your entire business model long-term. Let me give you an example why. And I had a client who 90% of his business came from Zillow leads, right? And he had his certain profit margin. And, um, and when Zillow came to him and said, hey, guess what? You're getting all the leads for free, but you're going to flex 35% off the tail end. Well, his profit margin was 27%. Going out of business, lights off. Because you just, you built your entire business model on a volatile lead source that you can't rely on. The quality, the flow, or the cost. Don't do that. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, one of the things I always talk about on here is attracting business versus chasing it. That's what I say with, with why you need to create content. And a website, yeah. a great example of that too is, somebody Googles you, your business and they find you, like you said, it's a whole different conversation when they're coming to you, you're chasing them. So that's why not only is the website so important, but the SEO is important. So people find your website. Totally. And that's exactly what you're doing with coaches content is you're trying to create video content that's compelling that they can put on their site and then they can cross pollinate, use it on all their different channels, even in their email marketing, right. To bring the business to you, but you've got to have a uniquely identified value proposition. Here's the problem with a lot of your clients and the other real estate professionals out there, you go to the, the web, their website and their value proposition is search for homes in city or browse MLS in like, cool. That's what every other real estate agent on the entire face of the planet can do. Congratulations. Like that's not unique at all. And so they're just going to click and go somewhere else because why wouldn't they just go to Zillow or open door? <laughs> Get the joke. <laughs> so what happened today or yesterday? Um, so, so that's another thing. Maybe we need to have another episode and talk about unique value proposition identification and how to articulate that appropriately on your website and all the other channels because it's super important. For sure, yeah. Um, so one last question. Yep. Because um, I forget that, you know, I know about SEO, you know about SEO. A local mm -hmm. business owner might know nothing. So I think the good last question is, because we talked about, you know, you have to create content and they have to write blogs and stuff, but we could maybe give a brief overview of what exactly an SEO agency will do for you so that, you know, when you go to them, whether they're full of it or not, you kind of sure. know what, what they should be doing. They should be managing the entire campaign with your input, executing all of the workflow, the content being added to your website, how it is designed, what it is written like, as well as the meta metadata, headers and footers, all that kind of stuff onto the website. Um, they should be performing backlinking activities and reaching out to other enterprises to bring in more juice to your platform and then optimizing any other landing pages, you know, or pages that we have out there that aren't your direct website. Because there's a lot of interlinking in the SEO space. And then you should be getting a monthly, at least report, but probably a reporting call of them delivering the results to you. This is what you got. This is what we did. This is what we saw as an increase in traffic in our, in, on Google Analytics you know, back end of your website, ranking authority score, et cetera. And this is where we're going to be going over the next month. Do you have any questions? It should not be, you put a quarter in the slot machine and pull the handle and hope you get something good. If you're not getting that kind of white glove service, it is not worth your money. It's not right. And you should, and it's, it's your business. You have the authority to ask those hard questions. And if you want some advice, like reach out, like I'm, I can be a sounding board. If any of your clients have questions of, are these guys up to snuff or not? Cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. So where would, um, you know, I can put in the notes your contact and stuff, but what's the best way for people if they do want to talk to you to reach out? Yeah, totally. So uh, DTAM at Pensarita, P-E-N-C-E-R-I-T-A dot com. You can also go to the um, Pensarita website and register for the newsletter if you'd like. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups. You can hit me up there, David Tam. I don't even remember what my profile picture is, but you can tell them. <laughs> and then really at the end of the day, you know, respond, comment, ask questions in coaches and content. You know, I'm part of the group there. And I'd be happy to participate in that discussion. So sorry, as you were talking, I just signed up for your 
Tends to read a newsletter. I didn't know. Oh, there. sweet, dude. Let's let's share the screen. Let's show the website. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. Why not, man? It's yeah. yes. So when is it actually? Uh, when is it launching? Yeah, man. So so watch the video for everybody that's watching this. Uh, we're gonna go into beta literally next month. We've got two hundred beta users, and then we're gonna do any kind of refactoring and uh, you know design changes, etc. And then we should be launching uh, early next year. Is our hope. We're already, we've got the app live. It's on my phone already on test flight. So it's, it's looking really good, man. So what's the, um, I see the, there's a, it's just a landing page for now. Um, mm -hmm. but what's so, what is the, is it like, what's the functionality for it? Is it like you log into it like Facebook on your desktop? Yeah, you can. So we've got the entire web application that, that'll have all the bells and whistles. And then we've got an app that's um, already on uh, test flight for iOS and Android. So it'll be an app because in the system itself, you can literally like record, drag and drop and take oh, pictures, wow. and add copy, and then it can transcribe. And then you can say, share this in six months with X, Y, and Z or allow others to collaborate. It's like, it's like standing on the shoulders of dying giants, i.e. Facebook, who lost 26% of their market share. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the goal. So you can actually make your content in the app. Yeah, totally. I, I think that's part of why TikTok has blown up so much is because mm -hmm. how easy it is to create it within the app. So for you guys to do that too, that's super smart. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then of course, like the collaboration aspect of, can you imagine if you were in Instagram and you could have seven other people all creating at the same time in the same channel and then share it when you want with whom you want at a later time, like that would be pretty cool. doesn't exist today with ex the exception of Pensarita. That's so crazy. Now I just have a million questions about Pensarita. <laughs> I want to ask you like, well, I tell you what, when we, when we launch it and it will all, you can have first dibs and I'll, I'll hop in. Well, first list, right. And I'll yeah. hop in. We can do a fan call on it. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm, I think it's going to be big and I'm curious how you get it out there because it's so it's a combination of all the good stuff from all these other apps and you're putting in one app. That's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to extract all the cancer from the current crash test experiments of social media that are, causing 14 year old girls to kill themselves because they have heating disorders because there's unsolicited toxic feedback and advertisements with, you know, 98 pound supermodels judging them. We want to get away from that, right? We want a platform where people can really share and grow and live, you know? And so, yeah, that's, that's the goal to make the world a better place. That's a great way to end it. Cause one of the common themes that always comes up with everyone I interview is providing value and leading with value. And that's exactly what you just said. And that's why I think Pensarita is going to be big is because you're coming from a place of adding value. I hope so. I hope so. We're trying hard. <laughs> Give it up for David, guys. David, I Thanks. appreciate you coming on here, taking out the time. Totally. Hopefully have you back again soon. Um, so again, guys, you want to reach out to David. He's in my group. I'm friends with him on Facebook. I'll put his email in the description and, um, We'll be back next week with another great episode. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Zach. It's been an honor.